Pardon the interruption, I'm Amy Poppinga. Friday, July 29th is International Tiger Day. Sam, any thoughts on tigers? They're great! Now I realize that's a little bit of a dated reference, but it allows me to run this clip. You two want to take a horsey ride? Uh-oh, Tony. Sure, but first we'll start with a complete breakfast, including my vitamin pack Frosted Flakes. They bring out the tiger in you. We'll see how good you are. Frosted Flakes good? They're great! Show them you're a tiger. Show them what you can do. Go, tiger! Taste of Tony's Frosted Flakes. Can they ride? Brings out the tiger in you. And you. Welcome PTI, boys and girls. I'm Sam Mulberry. Amy, we're back for we our are. last Hi, webisode. I know. I cannot believe it. So, yeah. Uh, yep. This I like year what you're wearing in this thanks, episode. Yeah, thank you. You too. This is new. I just it bought is. this. It is. It looks so, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> no, with contract negotiations this season, I wasn't sure we were going to make it all the way through. That's right. Did. That's right. Boy, are our agents relieved. <laughs> so in our last discussion board, we uh, had students write about sort of their experiences mm -hmm. with science and maybe with some of these faith yep. and science issues. So we thought we might take a moment to just sort of talk a little bit yeah. amongst ourselves about that same question. Yeah. So I think that for me, I always, and, and actually going back to the um, responses that you wrote um, earlier in the week, I just, the the ones that kind of came in early that I was reading over the weekend, folks that needed to get it done before Monday, um, it's, it's really interesting to see the diversity of opinion on this whole question of when do we rely on science and when do we sort of rely on faith and the mysteriousness that comes along with it. And so I really enjoyed um, reading those and it always brings up new questions for me. I know that in my own home, this is um, something that we actually maybe not talk about with great frequency, but as somebody who frankly doesn't have a very scientific mind and has never been bothered by certain questions like when, um, how has God always been? How will God always be? Those aren't the sort of things that necessarily have caused me to um, to wrestle with my faith in God. But at the same time, um, I'm bothered more by certain types of questions about like evil in the world and why one person um, suffers and why another doesn't. Why was I born where I was? Why was I not? But then my husband kind of actually sort of has the, the opposite. Um, and so for me, in this interaction between looking at what students have to say, it's really fascinating. Some of you wrote things um, that uh, I fully agreed with some of you brought up things that sort of caused me to um, to consider the fact, like one student wrote about the idea that we are kind of in a time where um, people are very dismissive of facts if it really isn't in line with their opinion. So when is something your opinion and when is it letting faith be what guides your decision making? Um, and that was something that I've sort of been thinking a lot about. I know you, though, um, you have a slightly bif different background than I do. You even had a different major at one point. Right. Well, and what, what's interesting, um, uh, I grew up, and this is actually going to be really CWC, I realize. Um, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Yep. So I went to Catholic schools um, through high school. And um, I realize as I look back how formative that was on how I think about faith and science. Uh, and actually, it's it's very much like Aquinas. Like like that's yeah. like I mean, we didn't talk about Aquinas, but I realized like, oh yeah, that really sh his Aristotelian nature really shaped um, how I view some of these things. Um, so yeah. so to me, I didn't grow up with a tension between faith yeah, and, and science, I didn't religion either. and science. Yeah. So so I I guess I've never I've ne and that was so formative to how I learned biology and yeah. chemistry and physics and on all those things. So. Even when I came to Bethel and I've encountered people who really wrestled with that, I, I think that um, that I that's never been a huge a huge area of tension for me. But I've always been interested in the people for whom it is. For whom so like, it is, yeah. yeah. And like I um I happened to grow up with a mom who was a biology teacher at a Christian school, and so that was always so same thing. I didn't grow up with this being a significant area of tension, um, as you said. I mean, I don't know that my mom would have articulated her view as being like an Aristotelian view, but that's certainly what it was. Um, I mean, I remember as a kid, like, my mom would clean up after dinner, and then she had to, like, prep for lab the next day, so she'd literally go to the freezer, and it was like, okay, Tell me well, she pulled out fetal pigs. She, she pulled out frogs, uh, usually, like, frogs it. that were, like, splayed out, like, this, ne literally, like, next to the bomb pop popsicles that were, like, blue ones. Um, but, um, and so, what, but one of the things I really appreciate about Bethel, even though I, I only took one science course when I was a student at Bethel, but one thing I really appreciate is the, um, 
the diversity of opinions um, and uh, approaches that are taken within our science departments and the real benefit I think that that has for students as they prepare prepare for careers um, in science or going on to medical school. I think it's one of the actually the yeah. sort of premier advantages of going to a Christian university like Bethel. And I would say and I would say um, that when you're on campus you know, you sh even if you're not a science major, like you should encounter some of those, yeah. some of those profs and talk with them. And, you know, and not, it doesn't need to be like in a, like argumentative accusatory, no. but to figure out like, like how do they wrestle with that? I think yes. that's a really, really interesting question. Absolutely. Um, Amy, I want to give you a little bit of time to talk. We've hinted, <laughs> I feel like throughout this, throughout these webisodes about um, sort of one of your favorite, uh, favorite folks from this, uh, that we talk about in this course. We finally got to John He's Wesley here. and the Methodist <laughs> movement. We're just going to, going to pass the ball to you a little ISO Yeah, brain. no, I just, I mean, you know, uh, I am now attending a Methodist church and so and I talk about that quite a bit and the influence that the Methodist tradition um, has had on me over the last couple years and I guess why that is quite special to me is because it really is tied to my teaching of CWC that I mean I was familiar with the Methodist tradition before that and had some grandparents that um, grew up in the Methodist tradition but it was really studying the the life and the tr the, the sort of faith trajectory um, of John Wesley in this very you know, this very significant time point in history um, where there is this tension between faith and science. We're entering into the Enlightenment. Where do we find answers? How do we reconcile um, faith with what's observable um, in nature around us? And the Methodist model and John Wesley's approach of um, what's called the quadrilateral. And, you know, now you might be familiar with that, but the idea that um, we do, you know, we start with scripture, that scripture is seen as um, authoritative and that God um, works through scripture, we learn about God through scripture, we learn about history through scripture, and because of that, the tradition is important. How have the people who have come before us um, interacted with the scriptures? What has been the, the, the path of Christians who have encountered, who have struggled in their own cultures? What can we learn from them? But then at the same time, we also need to put in this quadrilateral um, reason um, and applying reason and rationale and understanding that we do have different types of information available to us in whatever time period that we happen to be operating in, keeping in tension that we have what we know right now, but also knowing that it's not fixed either, that a society 100 years from now, a two, 200 years from now, um, they are going to have kind of um, different information and different uh, or access to different um, ways of making decisions than we do. And so there has to be a flexibility and a room for that. Um, and then at the same time, experience is really important. And by experience, we mean um, what I've experienced, what you've experienced, what we've communally experienced, what can be experienced together, what can be um, experienced also individually with God. And so that approach for me, kind of combining all of those, and I will say for you, even this summer and you know, many conversations about the po about politics in America, many conversations about what's happening in our world, um, you know, and, and a lot of fear, a lot of tension, a lot of disagreement, a lot of turmoil. Um, I have just really been so appreciative to have found um, the Methodist tradition at this point in my life to really be able to lean into um, the church model that we're a part of and the fact that it's sort of it's sort of bigger than itself. Um, and John Wesley, one of the his key ideas was that a congregation is not about the pastor. Um, and I think that was so uh, that was um, very that was really uh, I don't know, he kind of was predating. Um, his time there and in, in, in sort of this age where I feel like we do see I'm not knocking anybody's experience but when we do see so much of a church's success is tied to the personality of a pastor and hear that in the 18th century John Wesley was so concerned about that and the idea that um, uh, the success of a church should not be based on one person um, and so how that's been something my husband and I've had to adjust to but how useful it actually is for um, this point in time where you just you, you sort of figure things out as a congregation but you have a model to follow so if I haven't convinced you I don't know like <laughs> right. so so in, in CWC in, when we teach it in the face-to-face -face, uh, version we end you know right around the year yeah. 1800 or so and one of the things that you know we talked a little bit earlier in the some earlier in the summer about how one of the fun things about the online course is we're able to push the course forward beyond 1800 and actually talk about the the 19th century and, yeah. and the 20th century um, so one thing that I always think is interesting is like, what are the things that you guys get that our face-to-face -face students don't? Yes, yes. Um, so this is like the bonus. This is the bonus yeah. material that you don't get. Um, the second half the of unit three is all. Yep. Yeah. So when people are like, "Where'd you get that cool 1800 mug?" You're like, "Well, it took summer." So That's right. See. So Sam, for you, what are um, what are you most glad we brought back? What do you what are you what do you like that we've included that we don't necessarily get to during the semester? I think on its face, it's going to sound a little strange, um, but but I actually really appreciate that we talk about folks like 
uh, Marx, Narwa, Marx, Darwin, and Nietzsche, um, because I think they provide yeah. significant modern. I mean, and so we talk. You know, in the last episode, we talked a lot about how Newton sort of set up the modern world. They provide some um, some critiques of the modern world and really set up modern yeah. into postmodern and, and 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 sort of the next wave of questions. They're in some ways they're the logical playing out of some of those ideas growing out of the. 17th century and yeah. 18th century. People so people saying, "Wait a minute." Yeah. So you know, and I think um, when I when when we used to teach this course, when I took this course, um, when I first started teaching it, we did stretch into those time periods. And some of my favorite conversations to have with students were about wrestling with some of those things, like wrestling with, okay, what if, what about Charles Darwin? What about that? Or um, or what about what Nietzsche is talking about in terms of have we as a as a group, have we killed the idea of a need for God? Was that yeah. something that that we needed as an explanatory force? And now we really don't. Um, you know, one of the one of the things the powerful things about that reading is 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 towards the end, um, sort of the madman who's talking and you know saying God is dead and we've killed him, sort of says well, maybe I've come too soon. Not that he says he's wrong, but he's like maybe you guys aren't ready to hear yeah. this yet. It's happened. I mean, he's saying we we've killed that idea a long time ago. It's just we haven't noticed it yet. We're still clinging on it. And I think that's actually a really powerful thing to wrestle with as we think about the sweep of Western of Western history. Um, and I think to to not wrestle with that, I think we lose a little bit. Now, one of the nice things in terms of the Bethel curriculum is we don't talk about those things in CWC, but they do get picked up in later parts of the yes. general curriculum. Yeah, so, we're launching, CWC is launching you into further study. Right, so so one of the reasons, to, you know, why you take this course is that it, 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 it unlocks some, uh, as a prereq, some other courses, so the L course and the U course. So I want to talk a little bit about, you teach a U, I teach mm-hmm. an L, so uh, maybe talk a little bit about your U course and, yeah, so and how I, it connects to CWC. Yeah, just real briefly, I teach a course called HIS 212U, um, which is the history of Islam, and so maybe um, we had some interesting, I know with the students in my small group interactions, um, when we were sort of taking a little bit of a look at the early history of Islam, and then, you know, our, our story diverges in CWC away from um, the, what at the time, of the, the Middle East, um, but then, you know, they didn't stop. What what happened there, and how does the history of Islam develop? Um, how does it spread out? It does not just stay in what's present day Saudi Arabia, but it goes to the east, it goes to the west, it goes to the south, it goes to the north, um, and then eventually. So the the course kind of picks up. I mean, we go back a little bit and we look at the history there, but we really focus on 1800 up to the present. Um, the state of uh, Islamic communities around the world and how they become global communities. So in a way, it's sort of, here's what was happening while, and then at the same time, how Islam then um, not comes back, but rather starts to enter into the um, the spaces and the places that we leave off with in CWC. And so then I know that we also um, have HIS 230L, mm-hmm. um, which Professor Garrett teaches, and you're probably more familiar with that I than am. I am. Yeah, so the, and, and, and Chris has talked about this a little bit, um, this is the the travel course that we teach in January, including this upcoming January, uh, on the First World War, uh, and I, it's really interesting to teach that course um, as somebody who teaches CWC because so many of the things, especially the outset of the war, if you think about um, the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution, there's all of this kind of um, positivity and progress, yeah. and you see that progress hit a wall that's called the First World War. Yeah. I mean, that, that there's all this momentum, this rise in nationalism, rise in, in industrialization, and all of those pieces come together to become the fuel that, that sparks this, this war. And it's which it's horrible. Is, exactly. It's, you know, it's, and, yeah. And yeah. I think that sometimes, you know, World War II, obviously incredibly significant, but then that overshadows the, exactly what you're talking about with World War I in terms of, like, what World One speaks to us about how all of these things collide, and they fail, right, and it right. implodes, you know, spectacularly. Yeah, and it, so so in the course we get to go to those places, and we get to we get to visit them. We get to learn about the build up to the war. We get to learn about the war itself. We get to live, learn about sort of the post war and how that leads into the Second World War. So I mean, the first and Second World War, whether you think of them as two events or one one connected event with this this twenty year gap in between, I mean, they are foundational for understanding the west in the 20th century i mean they there's so much and so much of it grows out of 
this story of the West that we've been telling and the interaction with Christ of Christianity with that. So um, I'm not saying it's CWC part two, but if, you know, if you're taking it with Chris and I, there's elements that feel yeah, a little bit Yeah, absolutely. Like that. No, and I think that, I mean, I know for me, I consistently reference um, CWC with students in all of the courses that I teach, actually, because I do think that you need to really try to hold on to this information and really see how it connects to um, what you're going to continue to study. So as we look ahead, next week is the yeah. last week of this course. What it do we is. have? Can you what do we have it? coming up? What yeah. advice do you have for so, students? So um, be aware that our third exam is just, I mean, it is right around the corner. So our third exam will be on Monday the 1st. Um, and so we, uh, by this time, I think people are familiar with that. You know what you need to do. Um, so, and it looks the same. It, is, it isn't any more content. It isn't any less content. The structure of it will look the same. But we also want to make you aware um, of the exit interview. And so we have this exit interview and it is due on August. 5th so you have a couple of days so it's due on Friday but the exit interview consists of some sort of large questions about the course so when you first hear exit interview I don't want you to think of this as like the um, evaluation you fill out at the end of a meal um, it's more it's more extensive than that you need to it's not just a uh, it's not a course evaluation rather this is like the final assignment so instead of calling it the final essays and wrap-up we refer to it as the exit interview but it's going to be a series of questions and each one of those questions so I believe you have five in total mm -hmm. each one of those questions you really need to um, approach it as you have each of the written responses that you've mm -hmm. written each week. So when you're thinking about the length, when you're thinking about the effort, when you're thinking about the attention to making sure that you include references, that you're using good details, that you're sort of crafting an argument, that you're not making broad statements that you don't support. Again, it's the exit interview, but each one of those questions you need to sort of think of mm -hmm. as an individual. And if I, if I put on my academic support hat, I mean, the piece of advice I would give is so that the exam is on Monday. Monday. Yeah. This isn't the final version of this isn't due until Friday. Don't wait till no, Friday to do it. In, it. Fact, yeah. in fact, what I would do is I would open it up as soon as it's available. Yes. I would look at those questions. I would give myself a little bit of time to kind of stew over them, think over them, jot some notes down. And I would think of answering each one of those questions as really a separate event. So there's Agreed. sort of five yeah. assignments. You will that are be part way overwhelmed if you think I'm going to sit down and knock this all out yeah. right now. Um, yeah. You won't come up with, you know, you won't you won't do your best. Um, mm -hmm. But you also want to make sure that you don't see this as an assignment that's due Friday, which means I can start Friday morning. You will not have time, and and um, it's really significant. And I know for some of you that have been nervous about exam scores, you have. Plenty of time, and you have all of the equipment you need to really knock this out of the park. And, and this assignment exists at the intersection of reflection on course material and personal reflection. Yeah, as I'm, as I'm yep, grading my students, that's, right. that's the two things yep. I'm looking for. And if I only see personal really reflection, to say. then yep. I feel like you're missing something. If yep. I only see course content but no personal yep. reflection, I think you're. Missing I always something. say your opinion informed by the material exactly. from the course. Exactly. So yeah, right. great. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome to segment two. This is our game segment for the last time. Amy. I know, last right. time, last time. We're going to so, play food chain. So this is our way of reviewing going into the last test, which is Monday. We're going to go through all of, mostly mastery vocab, mm -hmm. maybe a couple other terms. And Amy and I are each going to rank our top five most significant people. And we're going to stop at... From eight, this unit. Right, but we're going to stop at 1800. We kind of yep. veer into the 19th and 20th century. We're going to say, you know, forget Marx, World War One, that kind of stuff. We're just going to cut it off around 1800. Yep. And we'll each take turns going through, we'll kind of respond to each other's lists, and then you get to vote on Moodle. My understanding is that the competition is pretty close. I think if you win, you'll probably seal it up. Depending. Maybe, yeah. I uh, I don't like to... And I understand from the last sort of time you and Sam did food chain that you have no problem disagreeing with me. So this should I don't, be really good. I don't. Episode. And this is a tense food chain because yeah. this is a tough one. There are... This could have gone... Multiple different ways. I had a very hard time putting together my list. So, so am I going to go first? Or you you're going to go first. Right. Okay, so I'll Take explain. It away. Kind of my, uh, <laughs> my approach to this is I'm going to go a little bit off center, and I'll have a couple of you know ones that probably are in Amy's list. I also want to make sure we talk about a few people who would be easy to overlook, especially as they hint towards future directions of Christianity and Western culture. So let's start with George Whitfield. So we don't say a whole lot about religion in the 18th century, but it was a theme from your last film. And we could talk about Jonathan Edwards here. You've heard Amy this episode talk about John Wesley. I'm going to say George Whitfield is significant because in many ways he is an indicator of where Christianity America is headed. And not necessarily in good ways, but significant ways. Um, first of all, the idea of a celebrity pastor. George Whitfield is the great celebrity pastor preacher of the 18th century. Something like a quarter of all people in the North American colonies actually personally hear him speak, and then you know, his sermons are published. 
And I think if we look at then Christianity in the 19th and 20th century, we're just seeing other Whitfields all the way up through Billy Graham and, again, better or worse, Joel Osteen, people like that. I think he also suggests the kind of a um, little bit less um, fussy nature of American Christianity. He doesn't really care about denominations. He doesn't care about church structure. He's willing to work with Baptists and Presbyterians and with Methodists. And even if he disagrees theologically, I think that's really typical of American Christianity, especially on the evangelical wing. And then his emphasis on um, emotion, his emphasis on sharing stories, on testimony, on, on religious experience, again, is very typical of American Christianity, for better or for worse. So I'll say he's number five. Number four is, I mean, a fairly uh, obscure figure in some ways, Oluwude or Alauda Equiano, whom you met and wrote a response paper about at the end of the unit. Now, I include him here partly because in his own time, he actually was hugely significant. We just don't remember. But he was a best-selling author in 1789 until his death in the 1790s. His uh, memoir goes into multiple reprintings. He plays a key role in the abolition movement. I'm going to say he's significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, he takes our story full circle. He's an African Christian writing a spiritual memoir. And that should make you think of someone like Augustine. And in many ways, he actually is doing what Augustine did with Confessions. But he also is hinting at the future direction of Christianity, which is a southward direction. Um, by 1800, the, gl the global center of Christianity is somewhere in Europe, right? From the rest of the time up to the present, it's moving towards the south. So the demographic center of Christianity is now somewhere in West Central Africa, and it's moving towards Nigeria, um, the homeland of Equiano. And so I think that's important for us to remember that this is going to start moving out of Europe and it's going to become part of a transatlantic and a global story that eventually is going to take us all the way back to Africa. So he's a good reminder of that. Third, Bartolome de las Casas. So we have a colleague named Ruben Rivera who's a church historian. He's now Bethel's chief diversity officer. And one of Ruben's mantras is that Latin America is part of the West. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that because we spend so much time talking about Europe and about the United States, but one of the big historical phenomena that's happening is Spanish and Portuguese colonization and then exploitation of Central South America and the Caribbean. The Las Casas is a good kind of reminder of that movement as well. This is where actually a huge number of Christians are. It's where Western civilization takes new forms. But also, um, it suggests that an important role for Christians is to critique injustice in our own culture, and um, he is critiquing the central injustice of Western Christian culture, which is slavery and economic exploitation, first of the native population and then of Africans who are brought across the Atlantic to serve as slaves. And in some ways, that actually is maybe the story moving out of CWC forward um, as we become this kind of global story. Okay, now I'll go predictable with Isaac Newton. So on the last webisode, Sam and Amy debated whether he's the most important figure since Christ. That's a callback to, to an idea from the film. Uh, someone once said that Newton actually was more important than Christ. Um, I'm not going to put him first. I think he's obviously important for all the reasons Sam and Amy talked about, kind of launching forward this scientific worldview. You know, in some ways, everyone else is going to be a footnote to Newton. I will say there actually has been questioning of the Newtonian worldview of <laughs> physics because of someone named Einstein. And um, I think the postmodern move in the 20th century does make us a little bit more leery of the idea we can just master knowledge of how the world works. And so just for that reason alone, I'm going to put him number two. I'm going to put Adam Smith number one. Again, in the sense of, I think we tend to maybe not say enough about certain figures. And for better or for worse, Adam Smith is maybe giving us the idea that's most central to Western culture as we leave any sense of Christian ethics guiding, whether it's in Christendom or Protestant versions of it, Instead, Smith is suggesting that the law of nature here is actually one of selfishness. It's not moral, fundamentally. And yet, it still actually provides very well for the economy. And I don't know if we realize just how deeply we've kind of assimilated Smith's idea of an economy, which is not just about money, it's about what we do with our life and our work and what has value and how we define value. We, we do this in so many ways. We do this in higher education. We do this with our personal life and our time. He is really defining work and leisure and value and the good life, and maybe not in such great ways, but in ways that even Christians have deeply assimilated 
here in the 21st century. So Amy, that's my kind of odd list. I think you have a different list. Yes, I do. Now this is really, this is, um, I really like your list. There's a lot of things on it, but um, I mean, the hard part with this is that, as I said, we could go multiple different ways, and I particularly like your inclusion of um, De Las Casas and Equiano in terms of um, figures who I think may be overlooked, but reminder that we are looking here at who's significant specifically to sort of the development of Christianity within, within Western culture, because we know there's people who may not have these um, figures on their list at all if they were doing this differently. So I want to go way back a little bit in terms of um, to the beginning of the unit, and I want to take us back to Galileo. So I want you to think back to conversations that between um, Professor Garrett and Professor Mulberry, um, two webisodes back, or the last webisode back, um, and think about this um, this uh, great conflict that Galileo faces in terms of trying to um, express to his society how we should view scrip scripture as it relates to what he is discovering through scientific inquiry and this significant heartfelt um, I mean, life-wrenching debate that is happening um, for him internally as well as externally with trying to say, how do we regard our understanding of truth and what are the ways in which God works? And just even actually revisiting Galileo um, this week for the course led to a really great conversation with my family about this very issue of when do we ignore that which we can observe if we feel like it's presenting some kind of challenge to the way that we approach scriptures. And so thinking about that in light of today, but think about that conversation. I think there's no way um, we shouldn't have Galileo on this list. And then the next person that I'm going to add, who I've already talked about just a teeny bit, um, is John Locke. And so we think about John Locke in terms of political philosophy, um, expressing these ideas that will go on to so significantly influence Thomas Jefferson and the, um, the democracy that we have here in our own country, that as flawed as it is, I know that you know a common phrase that we often hear is that um, it's the worst system except for all of the others. So the thing is, is the ways in which that um, Locke's ideas for equality and freedom, and we know not for everybody, and that's obviously reflected here in the writing of Equiano and in Professor Geertz's choice, but what, what has um, what has come across as better? What has been a better solution for trying to create some sense of equality within societies um, than democracy? So then the next figure that I have is I also am going to have Adam Smith here for all of the reasons that Professor Garrett's mentioned. And I think really central to this is, again, the fact that um, we're not putting capitalism up here as entirely good or entirely bad, but instead to say here is an economic system that then in, that completely um, changes, revolutionizes, not just the societies where it's first introduced, but ultimately the global society. And so how does, where does capitalism benefit and who does it harm? Does it need to be reformed? How can it be reformed? But this whole idea of um, a market system where you let it alone, where you're supposed to let those who are sort of at the, at the bottom, the consumer drive, what happens at the top. This is a fascinating, um, I think Adam Smith is a fascinating figure again, because we also know that he really wrestles with this. And with each of the individuals, we know that they are not completely black or white, that they're very well aware that the ideas that they are um, circulating and that they're going to ultimately maybe advocate for, um, again, can, can cause great harm if abused or if not um, implemented properly. And so, so relevant, um, I think, and especially, again, um, I really liked what Professor Garris had to say about how have we um, really infused this and adopted it uh, in a way, in the way that it's shaped our faith, in the way that we um, kind of combine Christianity with capitalism, and um, I think there's real concerns there and um, something that we definitely need to continue to talk about and consider. I have Mary Wollstonecraft here. You, you can kind of think of Mary Wollstonecraft as being my choice over having either of these two folks on my list. I also thought about putting William Wilberforce here because, again, I'm thinking about this may not be the list that, say, a professor in a different location would come up with, but this is who I wanted to include. And it's not just a token woman, okay? So I don't want you guys to think that I have this here because it's like, let me pick the one girl. But I think that she's incredibly significant because because she makes an argument against the commonly held opinion of the day, I mean, not just opinion, but the commonly held belief that women are inferior, that people of other colors are inferior, and that they're inferior because they don't have reason and rationale as a part of, of who they are, that they're not capable of it, and it's actually not even a part of the way that they were created. What I love about Wollstonecraft and its mirrored Nequiano is the fact that in their writing, they aren't asking you to show mercy to them. They're not saying, can you be kind to me because that, that would make for a better society if you would just sort of be kind and give us some sort of rights and elevate our status. Instead, they are using and they are demonstrating through their writing and through their thoughts that they are capable of reason and they're actually making rational arguments. So it's sort of like somebody saying to you, 
you don't speak French, and you say, not only do I speak French, but you say, Professor Garrett could probably tell us, you say, not only do I speak French, I do speak French, but you say that back to them in French. You like prove your point by actually demonstrating that you have the exact, you have the exact knowledge or the exact, um, the, you know, you have the exact power that they accused you of not having. You use that power to demonstrate to them that you do in fact have it. And then finally, and this is this is just me kind of being funny, but like who would I be if I did not stick with what I have been asked to argue and pledge my commitment to Isaac Newton as um, one of it, it, as the most significant figure in Unit Three? Because again, um, Isaac Newton affects everyone here. And yes, yes, we have Einstein, but we're talking about the people that we've studied. You did not study Einstein, so there's no point in pointing forward because we are supposed to be dealing with the information that we have. So. Fair enough. He also yeah. gives us Newton's apple, which was yeah. One of the there you go. <laughs> so Amy, I think of course your list was. is fantastic. I'm, I'm really surprised actually. Smith is so high on both of our lists. I know. Like, yeah, I think it's the time. I mean, I really yeah. do think this has been influenced for me by just the summer and politics. Yeah. I know. That's neat. Um, I mean, it's one of the cool things about the online course. It's like yep. Adam Smith gets maybe like three minutes in the lecture. I know. We each have done in the face-to-face right. -face course here. We've got this, like, now we call it the Smith unit. Yeah, like. I mean, there, there's a whole wing of the Modern Age Museum that right. kind of follows that forward. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm thrilled you picked Wollstonecraft for all the reasons yeah. you just said. I think earlier in a webisode, I suggested as we get closer to like the year 1800, that distant mirror you know, gets a little closer and we start to see more of ourselves. Yep. This is a reminder that as we exit like 1800, there are some, some significant things that have to change yet. Think yeah. about the fact that 60% of the students at Bethel are women. Right. That would have been utterly shocking. Right. A, a major source of joy, I think, from our Absolutely, but the right? fact that this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, right. Wollstonecraft write these things, but we know that it's going to be over another century before women are going to have the right to vote yeah. um, in the United States. And so... Um, again, like the, we're, we're laying some seeds here, but it's interesting the ways in which they um, aren't going to come together, um, you know, for well over 100 years in and some cases. And to pick up in the first segment, it's why like L courses and U courses are yeah. significant. Like U courses are starting to develop the, I mean, in some ways parallel or find convergence of West yeah. with non-West. But L courses, I mean, if you want to know how we get from Wollstonecraft trying to convince people women are capable of reason, should be educated to 60% of the population at this place, being female, like that's what the L courses are trying to do. Exactly, is, is bridge to that gap. That story forward. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. who won? Well, that's up to you guys to tell us. Go on to Moodle for the last time and vote for the winner of Food Chain. For the last time, Sam, it's happy, happy time. Happy birthday to Karen Torres. Karen Torres, who? She's representing Bolivia next month in the swimming portion of the Summer Olympics in Rio. I believe she's contesting the 50 meter freestyle, the sprint. Uh, Sam, what Olympic event are you most excited to watch? I think my favorite event are the men's and women's uh, 100 meter uh, mm -hmm. in track and field. In truth, I like anything that's timed. I love swimming. I love track and field because it's the. It seems like it's the most raw, like athletic ability. It's there's no judges. There's no points. There. It's just who can go from here to there fastest. Like that's super cool. So swimming, track and field, that's the stuff I'm interested in. Yeah, I thought you might say team handball because the last time we were in Europe for the World, War I love one, some team handball. Though. The World War One trip, we were in this. Our hostel in Paris had this cafe, and they had a TV on, and all they showed was the World Cup of handball, and we kind of were transfixed by the end. I think it's in Paris this January, And I think there's too. a chance we'll be going to it if we can get tickets for January 2017. It's this really weird event that it's almost entirely dominated by Europeans. It's like watching gym class played at the highest level. <laughs> it is. That, that would be my elevator pitch. Okay. Uh, Chris, happy anniversary to Prince Charles and the late Princess Diana whose wedding was an international TV event on this day in 1981. Chris, are you a fan of the Royals? If by that you mean the very trashy E! entertainment television series starring Elizabeth Hurley, kind of. We watched it streaming. I don't know if we'll watch the next season or not. If you mean like in it, like the monarchy itself, I want to say no. I want to be a good lowercase, lowercase D Democrat or lowercase R Republican say I don't care. And yet I did maybe wake up to watch the last big royal wedding of, of Prince William and uh, Kate Middleton. Kate Middleton, right? And I even made scones and tea. And like, so uh, I, I guess I have to plead guilty to being a fan of the royal. What if I met Eric Hosmer? I don't. You, you can 
I, they're a central division rival. I'm not going <laughs> to say anything nice about them. Happy trails to these seven webisodes. Sam, we're almost near the end of this fourth season of our webisode series. Do you have a favorite moment from the past season? Well, Chris, I want to tell you this because I want to point out that you said fourth season. So if you love the webisodes, and I know you did, okay, you, you love the webisodes on YouTube, there's 21 more of these. There's You can go Those back, binge watch Keep season going. one through three. And see then how it, often I repeat myself when yeah. I make arguments. Yeah, see how many of the conversations are the same. But, but seriously, Seriously, um, this has really been fun. I think my favorite thing is having um, Amy was on season two. She mm-hmm. taught uh, that summer, so it's really fun to have a third person, so we can do we can do more of the games and have because you and I have enough conversations yeah. as it is. So it's nice to uh, to bring somebody else. When in. We go to Europe. We play make the case all the time. Yeah, and we take out the cards. And we Our friendship food. is basically make That's the case true. and food chain. So it has been fun doing this. It's my favorite part doing the class. It's it's the synchronous synchronous part. It's the part we can update easily, and it's a chance to interact with each other and at least virtually with with students so hopefully you've enjoyed them hopefully they've been useful to you um this is also our way to review so you know as you take the weekend to prepare for monday's exam hopefully some of what we talked about uh is useful if you have questions there's no point really emailing about things to include in the next episode unless you want to come back for season five uh but if you have questions specific to the exam you can certainly talk to your small group leader um i guess we just have to say thanks for watching and uh anything else no okay i think we covered it Covered it all, right? Okay, let's turn off the iPads. We're done.